I know I know a ton about that, but I am a first time entrepreneur and there's a lot that I don't know. So the biggest thing for me was I need to figure out how to be vulnerable mm. and willing to ask people around me to learn, to be open to learning every day, to understand it's okay to say, you know, I've never written code. How should I evaluate people that write code for my company so I don't get you know, screwed? How do I make sure I make good decisions on who I'm choosing? And by being vulnerable and asking for help within the ecosystem, I think it made my path and would make other paths for other entrepreneurs so much easier. You have to be a little bit vulnerable and ask for help. Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Journey. I am your host, Devin Miller, the serial entrepreneur that's grown several businesses to seven and eight figure uh, businesses, as well as the uh, founder and CEO of Miller IP Law, where we help startups and small businesses with their patents and trademarks. And uh, today on the uh, podcast, we have another great guest, so Steve Walsh. And I uh, won't uh, take a, or ruin too much of a surprise about his journey, uh, but to give you a little bit. So uh, he worked for uh, quite a while with uh, Cox Communications and Comcast, and we won't hold, you, hold it against you. Uh, no just problem. Comcast is known for not having as good of customer service as many others. Uh, but then you had a, a good career doing the corporate gig, but then you decided to, uh, to uh, branch out on your own and to do uh, what you're doing now with uh, procurance and uh, we'll let you talk a little bit more about what that is and what you're doing and uh, doing uh, you've been doing some raising or uh, fundraising with friends and families and enough to get to the market and all those fun things and now you're uh, in the hopefully in the growth stage and uh, getting into the market and uh, taking that dive so with that welcome to the podcast thanks so much Devin I really appreciate you having me on today let me tell my story a little bit so well, I appreciate you coming on. So I told just a very brief, and I went over like 30 plus years of a career in about 20 seconds. So maybe with that, if you want to take us back a little bit and tell us a little bit about your journey that got to where you're at today. That was a pretty good job, by the way. You did a pretty good job for 20 seconds for my career. Uh, I, I don't know if I can do it justice, but let me try. So I am, I like to describe myself as a um, recovering operator and current entrepreneur and angel investor. So as you said, I spent 20 plus years in technology working for some unbelievably great companies in Cox and Comcast. Mm. And about two years ago, decided to um, leave corporate America to become an entrepreneur. And, you know, at the time, I really didn't know what this journey was going to be, be like, but I can tell you the last two years of my life have been transformative. And I've spent it learning and building uh, this company within this, what I like to call this startup ecosystem, that is companies like myself, a small company in procurance that I'm the CEO of, and we're trying to build that company to help small and medium business owners buy technologies in a digital way. And at the same time, um, I've been able to get introduced to other great companies because I pretty quickly realized I wasn't the only one with a really good idea. And there were other great entrepreneurs that were building companies who have done it before more successfully. And I started to get introduced to them. And I started to look at opportunities to invest in their companies and help them as an advisor. So uh, while I'm building my own company, I've started to invest in about 30 other startups in this ecosystem. And um, the one thing I will say is I call myself a recovering uh, operator because I don't know if I would ever want to go back to working for anybody else. I think you could probably attest to this. Once you've worked for yourself and you're in this, this, this bubble, I'll call it, this startup ecosystem bubble, it's really hard to break away because you get a tremendous amount of freedom. You get a tremendous amount of flexibility and you really get to choose the type of work you want to do and the people you want to do it with, which is just, it's an unbelievable gift on a daily basis. So hopefully that gives you an idea of, of my journey. It is. Now I'm going to make you go all the way back. No, it gives it very good. So, but if we were to go back, so you worked with, I think it was Comcast and Cox uh, Communications for sure. quite a while, 20 plus years. Is that right? About 20 plus years in the industry. Yeah. I had brown hair when I started, by the way. <laughs> hey, I, it's just like kids and industry and everything else. Eventually, they're going to make you either lose your hair or make it go gray. So that's it. But, so you did that. So, you know, so that's a good long while that you're in the, the working with what would be very big corporations. And as I joke, to be getting, you know, they, you know, at least Comcast, you know, they're always not, they're not known for their customer service, but they certainly have a very big brand, a very big reputation, service sure. provide a lot of service to a lot of people. And so, you know, 20 and 20 years is a good long period, is a pretty good stretch in the career to work for those companies. When you got, you know, 
when you got to where, how did you get after 20 years, you're saying, okay, I'm done with that. I want to do something different. I want to get into the startup world. Or what was kind of that trigger? What made you decide to take your career in a different direction? Uh, I think it was, I've spent a long time uh, in this space, as you said. And what I realized was, um, you know, you, you joked about, you know, Comcast reputation. I, I realize now the best part about what I do now is I don't have to cover my shirt when I go to the grocery store. So I get, you know, the people pointing the finger at me of who I work for. But what I realized pretty quickly, it was, it wasn't, um, it wasn't because the company didn't have great products. The products actually were really great. What it was and what the challenge for small and medium business owners was, um, they didn't like the process of how it was, they had to purchase these products. They felt that they had got to call a call center and meet with salespeople. It's this long process. It's hard. And every time change the name, right? Change it from Comcast to AT&T, Verizon, and people just go, oh, it's just hard. <laughs> and I looked at that and said, it shouldn't be hard. Every small business and medium business owner today wants more self-service options. They know they need technology, but they want someone to help them with it. And they want an easy way to do it. So I looked at it and said, well, in my life, I use Amazon for consumer goods and Kayak for travel and insurance for assurance. Why can't I build a platform that brings all the best providers together? And if I'm a small business like Miller IP law firm in Utah, based on my address, I can show you the cable company, the phone company, and all your options. You can look at them and make a decision and then make that purchase and do it all digitally without talking to anybody. And I took a look at were people doing this and there wasn't a lot of people doing it because it's really hard. And I knew enough to be dangerous coming from the industry. So I looked at it and said, I'm going to take my 20 plus years experience and I'm going to go solve this problem from customers. And I'm going to go build a company purely from the customer perspective that takes into account their needs and what, how they want to buy. And that really, that's what made me make the leap. So I think that's a great answer. And I'm going to dive into it a bit more just because, so you had the idea because I mean, diving into or drilling in just a little bit deeper because you know, a lot of sure. times you're in an industry, you can see something that doesn't work or something that you think can be improved, right? You're saying, why isn't this done? And you, you'll have a lot of people that that's as far as they ever get, right? They always have the idea and they say, okay, you know, this is, I think that somebody, you know, so he's, I think it would be a great idea if somebody would go do this so that nobody ever does it. They're always talking about it. You talk about it for 15 years or 10 years and eventually somebody does it and you say, oh, I had that idea 10 years ago. And if I'd only done sure. it, I would be the one that was the millionaire type of thing, right? So what was the motivation or how did you get, okay, nobody else is doing this. It should be done to, I'm going to, because, you know, you, you look at, you know, the companies you're working for, big companies, I'm sure they have good benefits. They pay you well. They, Great you know, benefits. They, and so what, what makes you just take the leap, say, okay, I have this idea. It's not out there. I'm going to go do it. I'm not going to wait for somebody else to do it. Because there's, you know, was it a slow incremental thing? You're just finally saying, okay, I've got financially secure enough that I can make the leap or I've, the technology has come far enough along or I just had it and I just want to do my own thing here. Kind of what, what was the final tipping point and the motivation that now I've seen that others aren't doing this and I can do, but what made you actually go out and do it? I think, um, I, I have a co-founder, uh, my good friend, Mo Yosefi, and he and I've been talking about this for probably about 10 to 11 years. And it all centered around customers and just the process and how frustrated customers would get with our industry and the buying process. Mm. And the more we looked at it and the more we studied it, when I finally get ready to make the leap, and I was looking for who else is doing this and who else is being successful and wasn't finding anyone, we looked at each other and said, no one else can do this. We have to do this because mm. we've been doing this for 20 plus years and we have the industry knowledge. And if you don't understand for working for the belly of the beast and understand how these products are sold and why they're packaged that way, you're going to have a very tough time building the type of company customers are going to want. And I've dealt with customers for so long getting frustrated with the process that I'm like, nobody else is going to do this. And the carriers aren't going to do it for themselves because no carrier, AT&T, Verizon, anybody is going to put up a transparent marketplace where a customer can make choice of all the providers. So I looked at it and said, someone has to go build this. The technology, to your point now, has come along where, you know, you can build a marketplace uh, relatively inexpensively. Now there are a lot of codes out there and technologies you can leverage. And mm -hmm. I also knew where to go to get the agreements in place and how to structure these deals. So I had industry knowledge that gave us really a leg up on how can we monetize this. So that's really 
When I looked around at who could do it, Mo and I looked at each other and said, nobody else can do it but us, so let's just go do it. And a lot of, you know, a lot of folks have looked at it and said, well, there aren't a lot of competition and someone else can beat you to the punch. I'm like, they can have at it, but no one's done it for the last 20 years, so it might as well be me. And I'm sure a lot of people said the same thing to the founders of Kayak or TripAdvisor or Jeff Bezos when he started Amazon. Nobody's going to buy stuff online. I'm a big Zappos um, fan. I buy a lot of shoes on Zappos. Everybody said you can never buy shoes online. Well, they're the largest retailer of shoes in the world now. So I guess they proved them wrong. So I think this is just another one of those scenarios where just because it hasn't been done doesn't mean it shouldn't be done. And I think we were the most qualified to do it. All right. No, I think that makes, uh, make, makes great sense. So now as you said, okay, no, we're the only ones that can do it. And I don't know, it, no, only was but the best position to do it, right? I, mean, I, think we're, I think we're very well positioned to do it. Yeah. That, no, that's the I way said, I would put it. Everybody, I, I, you know, enough time, money, and resources, you could always get something done. But best position, sure. the one that makes the most sense. And so you say, okay, we're going, we're going to make the jump. We're going to, you know, make the decision that we're going to go out and do it on your own. So as you do that, how was the transition? So, I mean, because you work for a big company, now you're saying, we're going to go do us on my own. How was that transition for you? Or how did you, you know, what was the process of leaving and getting your startup up and going and taking the idea from the idea stage to the concept stage to actually building it? Kind of, how did that go for you? Yeah, it's, it's been a journey. All right. it's, it's been probably about a year and a half of doing this. Uh, and mind you, I don't come with a coding background. I come with a sales and operations background and, and an industry background. So, and I don't look like your typical, you know, founder, right? I'm not 20 years old. I didn't just come out of Stanford and I majored in computer science, but I felt I had something to offer. So the biggest thing I had to do was immerse myself in this ecosystem and start surrounding myself with people that have done this before, whether it's people that have run companies and raised seed capital, series A, whether it's people that are in the coding space and could introduce me to developers that I should get associated with. I started to spend a lot of time with other entrepreneurs like yourself, Devin, that, and just started candidly being humble, being vulnerable and saying, look, I'm a great operator, but I'm a first time entrepreneur. So I'd love your help in this, or I'd love introductions to people that write code, or I'd love introductions to people that can help me on the marketing side. And that's how I started to build my team. And I surrounded myself with some great entrepreneurs that were willing. And what I realized about this ecosystem pretty quickly is that entrepreneurs want to help other entrepreneurs because they realize how hard it is and that they were once there. So by making the right connections and opening myself up to those people, they just went out of their way to help me. And that's really how we started. And we started meeting. And, and I like to say we went through the tour of you know the, every country in the world to find developers that could help us and really bring our vision to light. But I met almost all of my vendors, whether it's my, my virtual CTO, my virtual CMO, through other entrepreneurs that had done it before. And that was really, if there's one hack I've learned through all of this, it's that entrepreneurs want to help entrepreneurs. And if you really want to know what it's like to work for, with a developer or a bank or a lawyer, just ask the entrepreneur because they'll tell you. Hmm. No, and I think that, that's a good point. So, so now as you, you start to get yourself plugged, I would say plugged into the community. I, I don't know. It sounds like overused or, you know, terminology, or, but I think it's adequate or it, it describes it well, but you kind of, kind of get plugged into the community. You get here, yeah. learn from other people, you get that information, you get that feedback and everything else. So then you, then you get, have to get to the work of building the company, right? Which is now we have to figure out how to make this, how to build this, how to make land those contracts, how to, um, you know, get marketed out, get it out to people, make all that. So walk me through a little bit of that process. So now that you, you, you made that leap, you've got made this, started to make the connections, get the feedback. Sure. How did you go about building a company? Well, it's, you know, so there are things that I've run massive businesses. I've run $500 million businesses with 200 employees. So I knew a lot about businesses and budgeting, but there are things that I'd never done before. I'll use a good example that's in your space. I knew I needed, if I wanted to raise money, I needed to be a Delaware corporation, Delaware C-Corp. I've never done that. What's involved in creating a Delaware C-Corp? How do you do that? Um, I needed to raise money. So I understood because I had been investing before, but how do, do you use a convertible note versus a safe? Do we do a priced round? What does that look like? Mm -hmm. So those were sort of the table stakes that I had to honestly learn uh, as a first time entrepreneur. So that's what we started, incorporated the company. And a lot of people say, you know, worry about that stuff later. A lot of entrepreneurs I met with all hit me over the head and said, 
You're going to want to be an LLC and worry about the corporation later. Spend the money up front and do it because converting it later is really hard and there's so much peril doing it. So that's a great example I got from other entrepreneurs. So we just, we formed the corporation mm. and spent probably six to eight months finding the right developer, working on the code, which uh, we're at the place now where the site is up. We're up on all social platforms. We're doing our first uh, marketing campaign this week on Facebook. And we've got about a half a dozen prospects that we've talked to customers engaged. We've got proposals out to. So we're at the point now of let's start generating revenue. And we're doing a launch event in the next couple of weeks for our investors to showcase the website to the world and take it to market. Because, you know, as one of my investors said, revenue solves all problems. So we've got to get to revenue. It's nice that we've raised some money and built a nice product and got it up on social. But you got to get customers and monetize it to get to that next level. No, and I think that's a good point. So, and I'm going to, we'll get to that. But one thing I thought was interesting, because kind of the preload to the prelude, prelude, if I can say the right word, sure. to that is you talked a little bit about, you know, so you incorporated, I think it was around last year in Delaware. Is that what I remember from when we talked? Yep. And yep, you had, and then you did a round with, you know, what people call friends and family round, where it's, you know, connect either friends or family, or at least people you have connections with to get kind of that seed money to have enough to get you proof of concept or minimally viable product, even though I hate the word minimally viable product, which is- So do I. <laughs> but I'll, I'll give my 20 second tangent just because minimally viable product in my mind always means that you say, I'm going to put out the, uh, the the crappiest product I can as quick as I can and see if I can make any money off of it. And I always just say what, what I think makes more sense, at least in my mind, is almost do what I call maximally viable product. We're, let's see what our constraints are. How much money do we have? How much time do we have? What resources do we have? And let's put out the best product we can within those constraints. We wanna make sure we get a product out because to your point, you need to make money. But if you put out the worst product, then you don't know if it's really because you just put out a crappy product that nobody wants to buy. And why don't you do the best product you can within what you can and then see how it goes. But there's my, there's my 30 second tirade. So, but you did the, you did the friends and family round. So how did, you know, and that's what a lot of people or a lot of startups or entrepreneurs will often do, right? You go to the people, say, I got this great idea. I think it's going to make a lot of money and it's going to do change the world and all the things that you tell people, you know, the pitch that you give them. But how is it going to friends and family? How was it doing that raise and that round? Was it easy and everybody was knocking down your door to get money? Was it right. like pulling teeth and you had to go and beg and plead and steal type of a thing? Or how was that? Because I think that's a, an experience that a lot of uh, startups and small businesses go through. So it's interesting, and I appreciate you bringing that up. So when I first started, in my head, I'm like, okay, let's go talk to Super Rangers. Let's go talk to some micro VCs all around Boston. Well, I live in Boston, so we, in, in the Northeast. And mm -hmm. I probably talked to 30 or 40 of them, and every it was almost like it was Groundhog Day. It was, hey, this is a good idea, but you're a first-time, you're a 20-year you're a operator, first-time entrepreneur. You've never built code. You've never built a, you haven't had an exit. So why don't you go build your MVP, do a small raise yourself, and then come back to us when you have a little bit of traction, because this is a very interesting idea. And after hearing that 30 or so times, and your head wants to come off because it's a hard process, I, Mo and I were sitting down and I'm like, let's do this differently. Why don't we just bring it to the people that know it's the best, people that we've known for 20 years in the industry that have seen me build multi-billion dollar businesses from scratch, have seen me take companies growing at double digits a year and build world-class sales organizations and talk to them about our idea. And when I stopped talking to institutions and started talking to people that know me the best, my probably the best comment I got was from one of my largest investors. He was the CEO of a company and he, uh, my nickname's Walshy. And he goes, Walshy, your deck stinks, but I'll give you 25 grand just because it's you and I know what you can do. And it's not about the deck, it's about who you are and the entrepreneur and the idea and what you can do with it. And probably the nicest comment I could have gotten at that stage. And I'm fortunate enough that I had 10 other investors come on board, folks that have all known me and my career and some newer investors that this might've been their first or second investment, but they believed enough in the idea to take a chance on it. And what I really love is my, every one of the investors has been active, whether it's on social, they're constantly pinging me and it's not, hey, how's my money doing? It's really, hey, Steve, how can I help? I was thinking about you today and I was thinking about marketing and I have a great marketing guy you need to meet or I was thinking about how we could drive customers here and I want you to introduce this person. Every time they talk to me, they're talking about how they can help our company grow and I could not ask for a better group. And I think if, I, if you know, a piece of advice I would give to others going down this journey is simply, 
start with people that know you the best because they're one, going to be candid, but two, they're going to believe in you more than any stranger ever can. It doesn't matter how good you are at sales. The people that know you the best are going to see the holes, but they're also going to believe in you when you need it. No, and I think that's, but even if you are, it's, and I I'm completely agree. So I think that part of the reason oftentimes or many of the times, unless you're wealthy enough or you have what, you know, takes a very small investment, you don't need any friend, but if you're doing any sort of project product or service that needs an investment, I think a lot of times institutional investors are going to say, you know, we, why not go out if, if friends and family and people that know you and that you've worked with, or they care about you and those type of things, aren't willing to invest if they don't believe in you why should we type of a thing and vice versa if you can go and convince hey here are all the people that i do know me that are willing to invest even if it's a relatively small amount they're saying okay it at least shows that they have confidence in you and that you have the ability that you're serious enough about it right that you're actually going to because if you take friends and family money it's a lot harder to just go and say oh i gave it my best try it did work out type of a thing because these are people on the bike flip side you know and you want to make sure that if you take their money you give it your best shot so i think it's always a great indicator going to those people that do know you that have worked with you before that are the people that you have connections with and if they're willing to invest it shows that they have confidence in you and it also ties you more into you are you're going to fulfill your promise because you don't want to let right. those people down well you know and when i look at it you know this isn't a, a cap table of my uncles and cousins it's a cap table of three CEOs of companies, a mm. couple of senior vice presidents from, from companies I mentioned like Cox, Comcast, industry people that when they see them on the cap tape, like people are going to go, wow, so-and-so, this is good. So I think for me, it was validation of our idea. It also helps us, you mentioned signaling, it helps us signal to future investors, hey, these are some industry experts that back this company pretty early. That's a really good sign. So it wasn't just me going to an uncle, it was me going to people in the industry that I have tremendous amount of respect for. Some people that I've worked for in the past have been mentors to me to say, I think this could be the future of the industry. They agreed and they came into the company as an investor. So that's really worked out well. And um, I think it helps us with whatever the next round looks like for us. I think it helps us set the table because we've got the right people behind us. No, and I agree. And, I, and it's a lot of times it's almost kind of what the industry would call lead investor, right? Meaning if somebody has done the diligence, they, or, you know, they stake their name on it. A lot of times people coming along after will say, okay, well, they trust you type of a thing. We'll trust you as well. So I think that it, sure. it does a lot of good. So now you've done that, you've been built, you raised some money from the, you know, friend, I'll call it friends and family, but industry yeah. experts, people you knew, connections and whatnot, enough to start getting to the marketplace. I think that kind of brings us up to where you're at today. If you're getting ready to launch, you, you've got the product out there, you've at least got things and you're now getting ready to really push it out there and, and get that cash flow coming in and build it to a big uh, business. So you look at what's the next six to 12 months look like for you? Where do you see things going? I think for us, um, two things have to happen. One is we need to get to revenue, which is need to start monetizing the site and proving out our concept that Small and medium business owners want choice. They want transparency. They want ease of use, self-service, and a digital option to buy these products. So I think that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is once we do that and we now have a really good product and we've got customers willing to help us uh, get that product out to the masses, we'll probably be ready to do another raise uh, sometime this year. Now, I know everybody says, well, we're in the middle of Corona. You know, the venture capital community is very careful right now. Honestly, Devin, I'm not seeing that. I mean, outside of being the CEO of Procurance, I'm also an active angel investor. Mm. My deal flow now is 20% more than it was 90 days ago. I'm seeing more deals now because people are developing companies around COVID and around this crisis and around the financial instability in areas that would have never gotten built 90 days ago. So I'm seeing more deal flow now than ever. And I do think when I look at my own company, as a digital platform that can help with self-service, ease of use, speed to market, help with remote, remote workers. How do you get connectivity for remote workers at home? The timing on something like this could be great. So I think that it's still hard to raise money. It's never easy, but that would be the other thing that I think is gonna happen for us in the next six months once we get to, to revenue. Okay. No, I think that, that makes perfect sense. So 
you know, and, and I would say reflecting even, you know, when I, I said, I, I mentioned I do, and, and I do some of the startups and small business, but it folks on even on the IP law side of patents and trademarks, it was an interesting dichotomy in the sense that we had probably one or two months where things slowed down and it was a little bit of uncertainty, but now where we're at, we're busier now than what we were pre, you know, pre the pandemic. And it just seems like, you know, it's an interesting, I think that if you, you have to be willing to, anytime there's uncertainty in the market, anytime there's a, a change in the market, there's an upheaval or anything, you look for the opportunities. It's not that you take advantage of things, but you look for people have chinks in the armor. They have things that are, aren't being addressed. And oftentimes when, you know, when there's something that changes the marketplace, it reveals the chinks in the armor. And if you're yeah. smart and you keep an eye out for it and you know how to navigate it and pivot it, it can oftentimes put you in a better position than those that are just kind of waiting it out or not, aren't looking for those opportunities. So I've been complete agreement with you. Well, as we reach the, towards the end of the podcast, I always have a couple questions that I always hit on. So sure. we'll jump to those now. So the first question I'll ask is, what was the worst business decision you ever made? Uh, I don't know if I'd call it the worst. It's probably the thing I regret the most right now, candidly, mm. is that I didn't do this 10 years ago, is mm. that I waited. And I didn't make the, take the opportunity to work for myself, to be my own boss, to control my own destiny. Um, I have a brother, an older brother, who's been an entrepreneur for 30 plus years. And I, I've always aspired to that and looked at him and gone, nah, I don't know if it's me. I'm more of the corporate guy. And now that I've done it, I just keep like hitting myself in the head going, why did I wait so long? This, this is an unbelievable opportunity and an ecosystem that I think I can play in and do well. Um, I just, my biggest regret right now and mistake is I should have done. That's okay. Cause I still have some years ahead of me. It's not just all gray hair and I've got enthusiasm for it. So Better late than never, I guess, is a good way to put it, right? No, and I, I think, you know, and that's a hard one that I think a lot of entrepreneurs, you have a lot of people that want to be entrepreneurs or, you know, what the, you know, the entrepreneur type of an individual. And yeah. there are a lot, I think you can always find excuses for why not to do, whether timing's not good. You know, I've got, I'm a father of four kids, ages nine through four. And to say, go start a business, everybody says, well, you can't start, you know, you, know, you need that security of working for another. And I always look at it and said, well, yeah, but I don't know that they're going to be any more secure that I'm not getting laid off by them. At least if I do it myself, I'm in control right. of my destiny. And I know that it was my fault that I, I had to leave myself off, so to speak. But I think whether it's that or you can say, oh, now I'm getting close to retirement. I don't want to mess up my retirement. Or you can say, oh, I'm just getting out of school. I don't have the experience. I always think there's something that you can hold you back or you, an excuse that you can make. And yet I think to your point, dive in when you dive in is the best way if you have that itch, if you want to do it. Because you, you can always you can always try it out and say, hey, it's not for me. And I'll go back to the corporate life, but you don't want to get to where you can't do it anymore to the end of the career to where you aren't able right. to do it. And then you miss your open opportunity. You always wish you could lurk back. So I think that's- You know uh, what it is, Devin? It's, it's, um, I just want to be free to do what I want. I want to be able to do business with who I want, when I want, where what I want. I, I'm a big podcast guy, obviously. And um, I was listening to a podcast by a guy named Naval Ravenkan, who's the founder of AngelList this morning. I'm a big fan of Naval, and I'm a member of AngelList. And what he was talking about is this, this people that break away from corporate life. And he said, regardless of level, and I was a vice president at, at one of the largest companies in the nation, and it, I don't think it matters what level you're at. What he said is, if you have to work for another company where they can tell you what time to be there, what to wear, and how to act, then you're not free. And I don't care what your title is. And it's really true. And now that I've had this other side of it, and I just get the free decisions to take my time as I want and have conversations like this, I just think this is a better way for me to spend the next, the next phase of my career. That's all. Hey, you're preaching to the choir. So I, I've, I've drank the same Kool-Aid you have. So, all right. So now we're going to go jump to the second question, which I always ask, which is, so if you're talking to someone that's uh, just getting into startups or small businesses, just getting their feet wet, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give them? I think because I had to go through it um, as a former operator that was very skilled in industry, business, et cetera, I had to take a step back and almost say to myself, I know I know a ton about that, but I am a first time entrepreneur and there's a lot that I don't know. So the biggest thing for me was I need to figure out how to be vulnerable mm. and willing to ask people around me to learn, to be open to learning every day, to understand it's okay to say, you know, I've never written code how should I evaluate people that write code for my company so I don't get you know, screwed? How do I make sure I make good decisions on who I'm choosing? And by being vulnerable and asking for help within the ecosystem, 
I think it made my path and would make other paths for other entrepreneurs so much easier. You have to be a little bit vulnerable and ask for help. You can't take this attitude of, I'm the smartest, I know it all, I'll just figure it out. Attitude of, yeah, I know I'm smart, but there are people a lot smarter that have done this before, and there's probably something to be learned there that will help me succeed. So by being a little vulnerable, I think you can just go faster and learn more. No, and I think that's a, a good lesson to learn. You know, even if you are the smartest person in the room, and you, you know, the say you always goes, you don't want to be the smartest person in the room, you want to surround yourself with smarter people. But even right. if you are the smartest person in the room, you still don't know everything, and you don't have expertise and everything, you don't have experience and everything. And even, and then let's take it, even if you did have all of it, you're not going to be able to execute on all of it, right? You're not going to be able to do it all on your own. And so I think that there's a lot of times where you try and say either I got to know it all, or I got to be able to do it all, or I have to do it all. And it's kind of the, you know, the type A personality, the startup personality is you want to do it all, you want to control it all. And then I think if you hold on to it so tight, you're never going to get everything you need to accomplish. So I think that that's good words of wisdom. Well, people want to, or people want to reach out. They want to connect up with you. They want to use your product. They want to check it out. They want to uh, invest in you. They want to do any of the above, or they want to work for you, or they want to just pick your brain, or any of the above, or what all would, of the above. All of the above. <laughs> what would be the best way to uh, to reach out to you or connect up with you? Uh, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, Steve Walsh on LinkedIn. Uh, you can go to our website, Procurance with two R's, P R O C U R R E N C E dot com. We're also up on all the social platforms, but I'm a, I'm a huge LinkedIn person. I've got a pretty big presence there. Happy to, to respond to any requests to connect. And uh, I always like to talk to other people in the ecosystem, whether it's customers that need my help with service, whether it's entre other entrepreneurs that need help with their company or their product raising money. Uh, I'm happy to try to, to give as much as I get in this ecosystem. It's really worked out well for me and I'm happy to do it for anybody else. All right. Well, I certainly invite everybody to reach out to you for any and all of the above reasons. And uh, now for anybody that wants to uh, come on and tell their journey on the uh, podcast, we also love to have you on. So um, if you want to go to apply to be a guest on the podcast, feel free to go to inventivejourneyguest.com and apply to be on. And uh, don't for forget to subscribe to uh, the podcast so you can get a notification of all the new uh, episodes as they air. And lastly, if you ever need any help with patents and trademarks, feel free to reach out to us. We're always here to help at uh, Miller IP Law. Well, thank you again for coming on. It's been a pleasure. It's been fun to talk about your journey. And I, uh, I'm excited to see where the, the next six months or year takes you. And uh, in the meantime, good luck with everything. And thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for having me. Stay safe.